Las grandes historias comienzan siempre de casualidad. Dos caballeros en un caballo. Dos caballeros en un caballo entre el río Támesis y Fleet Street. En un segundo, después del corte, comenzamos a contar... Si Esta historia comienza con un mensaje y un caracol. La vida se manifiesta de formas extrañas. Trabajaba en un documental sobre los templarios cuando el destino metió la cola. Desde entonces sigo señales que no sé hasta dónde van. Solo las sigo, convencido de que el camino tiene un final y que voy a encontrarlo. Estoy en Temple Church. Niño, nuevo, ingenuo, dispuesto a nacer. No sé que este es el comienzo de un viaje que quizá no termine nunca. Dicen que Pitágoras dijo que el número es la ley del universo. El 26 es en la cábala el número de Dios. 26 suman los números de la estrella de David. 4 más 7 más 9 más 6. 26 es también el principio de igualdad. En la Biblia, en el Génesis, 1, 26. Y dijo Dios. Imagen, a 26 generaciones separan a Adán de Moisés. 26 es la carta del prodigio. 26 movimientos se necesitan para resolver el cubo de Rubén. Es el momento para atravesar las grandes aguas. ¿Y el caracol? El caracol muestra que la matemática y la naturaleza se parecen como se parece la madre y el niño. Hay un orden que quizás sea un mensaje. No sé si quiero ser el mensajero que lo transmita, pero también sé que ya no puedo elegir. Las ideas crecen en oleadas, como la fiebre, y se pegan como ella al cuerpo. Yo no buscaba nada cuando lo encontré, el mensaje y el caracol. El número que no comprendo, pero que quedará marcado en mi cabeza y me empujará a la cacería. Camino hacia Fleet Street tratando de convencerme de que todo es falso. Nadie puede salvar al mundo. Y menos todavía 26 personas. ¿Y por qué 26 y no 45? ¿O 12 o 36 justos? ¿O miles de desesperados? Y aún así, el mundo merece ser salvado. Vuelvo al mundo a través de una puerta. Estoy en Londres otra vez. Y la ciudad está plagada de señales que no entiendo.
En la Edad Media se trataba de salvar el alma o de salvar el mundo. I think it's far better to save one's soul, and if one saves one's soul, one does save the world. David Carpenter is the chief of the Department of History of Medieval of King's College. His father was the director of the Abbey of Westminster. He dedicated his life to study those years of cavaliers with a black cloak and a red cross on the head. In the medieval period, the two things are very, very closely related. You have to remember that everything is geared ultimately to one's salvation to going through purgatory as quickly as possible to re receiving the beatific vis vision to being close ultimately to christ and of course to being right on the day of the last judgment which is actually mm -hmm. vital but of course if one wants to go through all that if one wants to have hope of eternal life if one doesn't want to be cast like l like dives into the pits of hell then one has to live a good life on earth. So the two go very closely together. Concern for the poor, concern for your fellow man, those are going to be vital ingredients in your ultimate passage to heaven. But the presumption there is we've all got a chance. If we live a good life, we can all be saved. ¿En qué momento se empieza a vincular la matemática con el tema de la salvación, con el tema de la cábala? ¿En qué momento esas cosas empiezan a ir juntas? The link with ma of mathematics to salvation, I mean, that's a very interesting phenomena which takes place increasingly in the 13th century. I think you've got to remember that in the 13th century there are huge contact between the Islamic world and the, the world of the West intellectually. There's a great movement of ideas and ideas of mathematics, science and everything. I mean, the medieval mind was one very numerate. You needed numbers to solve these riddles. There may be magic numbers. You needed numbers for practical day-to-day -day affairs, like auditing the accounts of the state uh, and so on. But also, but that is all part of the ordered universe of Christ and of God. There's no contradiction between numbers and religion and Christianity, they all go together. David Sermon explica con destreza las relaciones entre la matemática y el caracol. Lo llaman número áureo o la proporción perfecta. En matemáticas se escribe phi. Los gajos de la naná siguen esa lógica. La relación entre abejas macho y hembra en un panal también. Los pétalos de las flores se ordenan por fin. Y también la anatomía de los humanos. Hay un orden. Hay un número. 1,6. Es la relación entre la altura y el ombligo. Entre el diámetro de la boca y la nariz entre la cadera y la rodilla. En base a ese número fue construido el Partenón y Leonardo dibujó al hombre de Vitruvio. Salomón juega con los números como un niño con sus soldaditos. El 26 es el único número natural situado entre un cuadrado y un cubo, dice. So, are there any other numbers such that they are a perfect square plus one and also a perfect cube minus one. You can do it for 26 if you take x equals five and y equals three. But you can't do it for 28, 29. This is the only whole number which is one more than a square and one less than a perfect cube. Twenty-six is the numerical value of God. Yehuda Berg is the rabbi of Madonna, Aston Kutcher, and Demi Moore. He directs the Center International of Kabbalah in Los Angeles. 
Sus libros han sido traducidos a 20 idiomas y dirige 50 grupos de estudio. En la Cábala, 26 es el número de Dios. If you, if you spell out the name of God, you get to 26. The, the four letters, the Aramaic letters, that make up the name of God. The first letter is Yud, is 10. The second letter is He, is 5. The third letter is Vav, is 6. The last letter is He, is 5. 26 is the name of God. And, 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 and that's the force, that's the light force that exists that moves everything in this universe. Without that, the, the, the force of the Creator, there's nothing. So that, that's what 26 means in, 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 in Kabbalah, is, is that force of God. Interestingly, not only in Kabbalah, but in other forms of teachings, mm -hmm. even in science, and I'm sure that, that when doing this, you can talk to other people who are going to bring other perspectives, and I'm sure you'll find the number 26 across the board. Every religion, every teaching, there's somewhere the number 26 is there. Dos caballeros en un caballo. Tipos de traje oscuro atraviesan las calles de Temple Church como si fueran extras de una película policial. ¿Será posible salvar al mundo? Este era el parque de casa de Enrique VIII en el siglo XVI. Ahora son otros los que están de cacería en Camden Market. Gays, rockers, góticos, cyberpunks, heavy metals. El mercado de Camden es un catálogo del Londres subterráneo y cerca de 100.000 personas se dan cita aquí cada fin de semana. Para llegar a la casa de Martin Amis hay que atravesar Candem. ¿Alguna vez se propuso salvar el mundo? Um, yeah, I, I've given it the occasional thought, yeah. <laughs> In which occasions? Well, whenever you write about um, things like um, nuclear weapons, the climate uh, debate, you are putting forward your infinitesimal contribution on these subjects. But I can only do it through writing, because um, writing is my contribution. If I join a demonstration, I'm just a, another pair of legs. Amis es hoy el escritor más importante de Inglaterra. Un escéptico que toma lentamente su té y estudia cada palabra antes de decirla. Borges está siempre presente en su memoria y en su biblioteca. Borges es Dios, me dice. Yo recuerdo aquel poema sobre los justos. Porque después de todo, no son los justos quienes estoy buscando. ¿Es una idea ingenua o es una idea posible la de cambiar el mundo? It's a, uh, in a sense, it's a naive idea, but it's, um, I'm a gradualist, you know, not a utopian, not a revolutionary. Um, I think you can inch things along and improve things, but not through radical means. Uh, The enemy is extremism of any kind. What has extremism ever done for the world? Nothing. The, the, the record of um, revolutionary reality is, is very discouraging. 
a revolution is a way of accelerating history, and it's very exciting and very intoxicating. But um, it always seems to overcorrect and go too far. We're living in a revolutionary time, which is exciting and worrying to, in equal measure. But uh, my last novel, which was about the sexual revolution, is entitled The Pregnant Widow. And that comes from Alexander Herzen, who says, I'll paraphrase, but he said, um, generally you, the soul welcomes the passing of the old order and the arrival of the new. Yet what is frightening is that the departing order leaves behind it not a child, not an heir, not a niño, but a pregnant widow. And between the death of the father and the birth of the child, much water will flow by, a long night of chaos and desolation will pass. And I think to look at it as a pregnancy with a long pregnancy is perhaps, you know, the, the best way to look at revolutions in that they happen and there is a, an explosion of energy. History is accelerated while the revolution takes place. This was always the idea. But then the change isn't made, the change is yet to come. It is always, you're always pointing towards it but cannot get to where you are pointing. When a marvelous new idea is born, it, we do not change our minds at the snap of a finger. We may think we do, but the unconscious is still with us and the unconscious belongs to you know, the fathers, the mothers, the past, and it's still there. La lleva a la primera ciudad de la revolución industrial. En el que procesaban toneladas de lana en la época de las camas calientes y es hoy el mayor centro de negocios financiero y de servicios legales en Inglaterra. Leeds tiene también tres universidades. En su casa de Leeds vive solo a los 85 años, Sigmund Bauman. Bauman es de origen polaco y nacionalidad británica. Acaba de recibir el premio Príncipe de Asturias y fue el creador del concepto de modernidad líquida. Miedo es el nombre que le damos a nuestra ignorancia, dice Bauman, el hombre que no tiene edad y piensa. ¿Alguna vez quiso salvar el mundo? I have no idea how to save the world. Um, when I was young person, it was long time ago, half a century or more, um, the main question seemed to me to be at that time, what is to be done? But today, the main question, uh, in my view, is not what is to be done, because on that topic we can come together, mm. discuss it, and come to some sort of a consensus. But the question, who is going to do it? It is a question of instrument of collective action, and uh, that is what we are actually missing. It is the question that the old tools of action which we had don't work any longer properly, but the new ways of acting have not been yet invented and put in place. 
So the old doesn't work and the new has, has not been yet established. That's why I call our period uh, the period of interregnum. Interregnum is an ancient Roman concept from Roman law and uh, interregnum was proclaimed until the next uh, king is selected or appointed mm -hmm. or takes power, whatever. Uh, all the laws are suspended. ¿Qué edad tiene? How old am I? Yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be really amazed. 86. 86. 86, wow. yes. I, 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 I keep repeating that I'm a dinosaur, you know, a remnant relic of old ages, really. Yes, I am 86. So uh, I have seen so uh, many, many, many regimes, many upheavals in history. And, Also, uh, changes of human mood and preferences and fashions and so on. And that's why I'm very cautious you know, when it comes to making predictions, really. Um, all truly important events of 20th century came absolutely unpredicted. No one expected them. How can you imagine that you can really predict flapping of wings of every butterfly in the world? It's beyond question, you can't. You know. Therefore, we don't, uh, we, we are unable to predict, not because we don't have enough knowledge, but because the world itself is unpredictable. What we call the regularity is a byproduct or a side effect of a lot of coincidences, contingencies, mm -hmm. accidents, and so on. Estar en Montevideo es como estar en casa, frente al río que parece mar, el mar que parece río. Eduardo es Dorian Gray. No envejece nunca. Celestes ojos pícaros. Escribe cada palabra que dice. Habla como hablan en Montevideo. Tiene todo el tiempo del mundo. Yo llego a preguntarle si se podrá salvar. Es una idea peligrosa en muchos casos. ¿Por qué? Porque yo desconfío de los mesiánicos. Por ejemplo, todas las expediciones militares se hacen siempre para salvar a alguien, a un país, para salvar la democracia. Siempre terminan mal esas salvaciones. Los mesiánicos son muy, pero muy peligrosos. Fíjate, los Estados Unidos invaden Irak para salvarla y la convierten en un manicomio. Han convertido ese país en un manicomio. Y ahora en Afganistán también había que salvar a Afganistán y están convirtiendo a Afganistán en un vasto cementerio. Vos formas parte de una, de una generación que en algún momento intentó cambiar el mundo. Sí. Y que, bueno, no quiero englobar todo, pero que por distintos motivos fracasó, o, o, o lo postergó, o lo modificó, sí, 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 yo o creo... se dispersó. Sí. Bueno, eso pasa con todas las generaciones, ¿no? Este, yo creo que el error eh, que muchos de mi generación cometieron fue eh, creer, eh, confundir la grandeza con lo grandote. O sea, creer que, que, ¿cómo te diría? Que la historia es una especie de superproducción de Hollywood donde todo ocurre en grande. Los grandes episodios, los grandes acontecimientos, los grandes hombres. Y esa confusión me parece fatal, porque en realidad las verdades más profundas de la vida suelen estar en las cosas más chiquitas, en los acontecimientos y las personas ninguneados, despreciados, que forman parte de la vida cotidiana de todos. Ahí es donde está la grandeza de verdad, la de endeveras. Uh -huh los soles que cada noche esconde.
dice en el texto y el caracol que 26 hombres podrán salvar al mundo. Debe ser una broma o una mentira que atravesó nueve siglos hasta llegar acá. ¿Cómo salvar lo que no quiere ser salvado? ¿Cómo salvarnos de nosotros mismos? ¿Cómo ser otros? Y en ese caso, ¿quiénes? El British Museum es una cueva. Es la cueva de un animal inmenso que dejó allí los huesos de sus presas. El animal arrastró hasta su cueva la belleza, las curvas, la inmortalidad. Se pasea entre ellas cada noche, antes de dormir. It's not what is to be done, but the question, who is going to do it? Yet what is frightening is that the departing order leaves behind not a child, not an heir, but a pregnant widow. And between the death of the father and the birth of the child, much water will flow by, a long night of chaos and desolation will pass. Technology develops is one of the major uh, causes of uh, uncertainty for a very simple reason. Hans Jonas, the great uh, ethical philosopher of 20th century, put it this way, that uh, technology in recent decades developed enormously in such a way that we are now, we humans, are for the first time in our history able Not even to destroy the world. On the other hand, said uh, Hans Jonas, our moral imagination has not developed very far beyond Adam and Eve. We are still at the same level. We see only our neighbors, we see our family, we see our tribe, we see our nation, we see our neighborhood, our city, But uh, our moral imagination does not travel beyond that boundary. I repeat again, the gap between power and politics. Power is the ability to do, to do things. And politics is the ability to decide which things are to be done. We don't have any tools to take globally binding decisions. Es como que inventamos el teléfono, pero no sabemos qué decir por él. Yes, well, uh, 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 above all, there is no one to telephone to in, uh, as far as the global order is concerned. The discrepancy between the enormity of tasks and the scarcity and the poverty of the instruments of action. ways that people divide is into those who are ideological and those who are not. Those who love revolutions, those who fear them. 
you know, Nabokov said that the world divides into those people who sleep well and those who are insomniacs. And he was, of course, mm -hmm. a gigantic insomniac. But uh, I think in the public sphere, those who need ideology, who need to feel a communal spirit and um, a set of ideas that, that supposedly answer everything. And I think that's why ideologies are inherently violent, because it seeks to answer more than it can. Aquí están los sueños de todas las batallas. Los pliegos de las estatuas parecen cicatrices. Los poros del mármol respiran otros sueños de perfección. Si hay una respuesta, ellos la tuvieron. ¿Qué hicieron con su respuesta? ¿Pudieron sobrevivir a ella? Después llegó el animal inmenso y los cazó. Los trajo a esta cueva donde vive aún. Dice Karen Armstrong en una plaza de Notting Hill que la religión es como el sexo. Si se la practica bien, puede ser sublime. ¿Podrá la religión salvar al mundo? All, every single one of the major world religions um, has at its core uh, an ethic of compassion, which means that you have to put yourself into other people's shoes. Karen fue monja durante siete años, pero Ahora se define como una monoteísta freelance. Impulsa una iniciativa ecuménica llamada Capítulo de Compasión, a la que adhirieron el Dalai Lama de Tutu y el príncipe Hassan de Jordania. Each one of the world faiths has developed what's often called the golden rule. Never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. And so the religion should be making a major contribution to one of the chief tasks of our time, which is to build a global community where people of all persuasions, all ethnicities, can live together in mutual respect. In the 20th century, um, ideology was meant to replace religion as a, as a casus belli, as the cause of war. You know, ideology was a kind of methadone to get us off the heroin of religion. But in, in fact, the very reverse happened, and um, mm -hmm. we saw savageries in the 20th century that we hadn't seen since the medieval period. Mm -hmm. No, I believe that people will believe in God forever, uh, but I don't believe in God, but that's my private issue. Uh, uh, Ulrich Beck, I'm quoting quite a lot of people, but um, they are good quotations because they are wise people. Ulrich Beck, the German sociologist, the greatest living, uh, recently published a book, God of One's Own. Eigene Gott, eigene, mm -hmm. private, you know. Uh, what he says that, uh, is that religion is thriving, religion is growing, religion is embracing ever and ever more people. The um, atheism is not any longer in fashion. That's very important because yeah, well. culture uh, acts through passions. But it is no longer institutionalized God. It is uh, God a la carte. <laughs> uh, every, every one of us produces, uh, pieces together God mm -hmm. with all sorts of elements. ¿Cuándo fue en su vida, en su vida personal, la primera vez que escuchó hablar de Dios? Oh, when I was a small child, um, 
and um, I found him rather frightening and confusing. He always seemed to be standing over my shoulder and disapproving of me. Pero que era como un dios vigilante que estaba ahí vigilándola. Yeah, like a cosmic big brother. <laughs> <laughs> we were exceptional in the, we were living in South Wales in the 1950s. And I remember I had a, to f fill in a form from school. And it said religion. Oh. And I looked at this and I went and called up the stairs. I said, Mom, what religion are we? And there was a very long silence. And then she said, Church of England. Everything <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. were. And I thought, good old Church of England, you know, it, it doesn't ask anything of you at all. You can just hear your Church of England, and that's the end of it. Very often you cr people create gods in their own image and likeness. Mm -hmm. And they say God wills this, God hates that. There's one thing that the world religions all agree on, is that if your belief in God makes you cruel, uh, uh, self-righteous, pleased with yourself, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably not a good idea. It's probably an idolatry where you've probably mm -hmm. got a God that is endorsing your position. Uh, but if but your God should lead you out of selfishness toward the other mm -hmm. in compassion, that's the test of, mm -hmm. of, of any theology, I think. Aun cuando no crean Dios, en algún momento de su vida se encontró rezando. Yes, but I mean, I think that's. Uh, I mean, it, it's be beginning to be felt now that that it's that being the religion is an ineradicable part of human nature. That uh, that there always will be that need. And uh, I, it seems to me perfectly straightforward what it's all about. It's, um, religion is a, is a rearguard action against death. Death is, is, is too much for us to contemplate. It's, um, it's too complex and too final and too frightening. So religion is what we have constructed to get us through this um, void at the end of our lives. Vuelvo a Temple Church como el asesino vuelve al lugar del crimen. Solo hay noche. Ni mensaje, ni caracol. Solo se escuchan los pasos de unos pocos habitantes y pueden imaginarse sueños detrás de las ventanas encendidas. No vuelvo a Temple Church, sino que desde aquel día no volví a salir de ahí.
a su edad el mundo lo sigue sorprendiendo. Uh, yes, but uh, I am prepared already to be surprised. You know, it's uh, when I was young, I still thought that there are laws of history, so you can actually predict. I was quite convinced. I, I quite frankly admit that, and that was actually what attracted me to uh, Marx, Karl Marx, in the first place, because he had such a tremendous certainty. Whatever is happening now is temporary, transient, and. Uh, Uh, history is, so to speak, on the side of justice, on the side of equality, on the side of reason, and so on and so on. Uh, well, uh, it proved to be different. I kept being surprised all my life, uh, but I stopped being surprised by being surprised. ¿En qué crees? Creo en eso que te decía, en la dignidad, por ejemplo, creo. Creo que vale la pena vivir con dignidad. Y creo en la gente que actúa de acuerdo con su libertad de conciencia y no cumple con el deber de obediencia. En el mundo, en la historia de la humanidad, han habido numerosos casos de desobediencia al poder. A veces individual y a veces colectiva, de grandes insurrecciones, de grandes rebeliones. A partir de esta necesidad humana de, so, de, de desobediencia para sentir que están, estamos vivos en este mundo donde, donde puede valer la pena vivir sin agacharte, mm. sin besar los pies de nadie, ¿verdad? Mm. Vivir de pie, dignamente, bajo la lluvia, pero, pero de pie. What we are certain about is now is this moment. We can't even be certain about tomorrow. Mm. What we can do is to make our lives have meaning for the world, so that when we come to die, mm. um, the world is a little bit of a better place because we've lived in it. But it seems urgent to me that unless we learn to treat all peoples, whoever they are, as we would wish to be treated ourselves, we're not going to have a viable world for the next generation. I am sure of one thing only. Unfortunately, I won't be opportunity to find out whether I was right or wrong, because I am a very old man, I won't see it. But uh, people who are sitting around me now, they are all very young, and my prediction for them is that uh, uh, their life will be spent trying to close the gap between power and politics. Then we raise our means of action to the level of the tasks which confront us. Uh, and that's a question of life and death. That is the major problem which confronts us. All the rest will be derivative. If we solve these problems, humanity has lived through many, many crises in its history, and there was always found a solution uh, to every one of them. Cornelius Castoriadis, the Greek French philosopher, mm -hmm. one was asked once, uh, Mr. Castoriadis, what do you, what do you, what, what are you talking about? Do you want to change the world? But he answered, God forbid, it never occurred to me to change the world. What I want is humans to change themselves as they did so many times in the past. So I am optimistic, mm -hmm. but providing that we have also instruments for action. I repeat, the major problem today is not what is to be done, the problem is who is going to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't see any institution which is able to carry such a burden.
How can you imagine that you can really predict flapping of wings of other butterflies in the world? The world itself is unpredictable. What we are certain about is now. We can't even be certain about tomorrow. Es una idea peligrosa en muchos casos. Unless we learn to treat all peoples as we would wish to be treated ourselves. En este mundo donde puede valer la pena vivir. We're living in a revolutionary time which is exciting and worrying in equal measure. It's not what is to be done, but who is going to do it? Estoy enfermo de preguntas y no puedo dormir tranquilo. Vuelvo, camino, busco. Viajo el fin de la noche como se nace, solo, temblando, preguntándome por qué.